Vocal Eye Almost Live Zoom. All About Opera. Chinatown. Hosted by Amy Amanti. With special guest, Julia Bonnet. Welcome to this Almost Live event. My name is Amy Amanti. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the Associate Director here at Vocal Eye. I'm your host for these online events, and I'm a member of the blind community and very proud to be a member of this community. A big thank you to all of those of you who have made contributions, both financial and in, in supporting us with the letters of testimony. And uh, I mean, it's just, it's a pleasure to read those. So keep those coming. It's all very helpful in sharing with our sponsors any impact that this programming makes on you so that we can continue to, uh, to gather the funding. So please know that we read all of those. We respond to all of those. So thank you so much for taking the time to do that. If folks happen to be watching this particular event on our YouTube channel, there's something we would like you to do, which is to just like take a moment and hit like and subscribe. That would really, really help us out. Vocalize broadcasting to you all from the traditional and stolen lands of the Coast Salish people, in particular the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the tsleil First Nations. And this week I wanted to share with you a bit what I learned about uh, the Haudenosaunee and uh, so the Haudenosaunee peoples have this really interesting uh, ritual around funeral rites. And there's a reason why I'm sharing this with you, but I want to share this piece with you first. This piece comes from Richard Hill and Peter Jemson. Uh, and so they say, at a traditional funeral among the Haudenosaunee, the speaker will tell the assembly that the deceased is still among us, but that it is preparing to go on a long journey, which is called the spirit world path of the deceased. Many items are placed in the coffin or the grave, as it is believed that these items that we use in life are also necessary uh, to take on this death journey. So these tool, these would be items like tools and utensils, medicines and weapons, and these would all be considered crucial to the success of this journey. Often the speaker will say, we have now returned the remains to the earth, which the creator made when the creator made the original peoples. So the remains shall be returned to earth our mother. The Haudenosaunee believe that neglecting to feed the spirits of the dead can cause illness to the living. So a special death feast is offered for the departed. And then 10 days after the funeral, another feast is offered. At the same time, they distribute the personal belongings of that deceased and the deceased gets to start on that uh, final journey. During the month of March, coincidentally, we are in March, so this is so uh, apropos to share, that most longhouses have a special dance dedicated um, to the journey of the dead, and this is to ensure that, that folks are properly taken care of in the afterlife. That's just a, it's just a little snippet. This is from the Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, often, um, I think, uh, uh, where their lands are in Toronto area and part, other parts of Ontario uh, and other parts of Turtle Island. But I wanted to just share that little piece with you um, because I also want to acknowledge uh, the passing of a legend, a legend um, in the advancement of human rights for people with disabilities. Judy Human passed away this week. Um, if you haven't seen Crip Camp, go look up Crip Camp. Um, Judy Human was instrumental in getting legislation enacted in the United States and the legislation meant through sort of many iterations uh, and many names. I think it was first called something about, you know, the rights of handicapped people, that kind of thing. But it really led to what we now know as the Americans with Disability Act, which of course is percolated into Canada now that Canada has a, a Canadian uh, um, Canada Disability Benefit Act. So we can't overlook the fact that this human has made such an impact on our lives as folks with disabilities. So I wanted to honor that. And it also seems seems apropos considering that um, this is International Women's Day. So uh, acknowledging that for our passing of Judy Human, and I know some of you, Tony mentioned that he had had the pleasure of sharing space with, with Judy in an email to me. Um, so some people have known known Judy and met Judy personally and, and worked with Judy, Judy as well. So a happy International Women's Day to acknowledge Judy's passing and also to all the women and women uh, female identifying folks that may be joining us in the states, uh, in the states, in the space rather. So thank you so much for joining us and a happy Women's Day to you all. 
It's a Wednesday, March the 8th, 2023. And tonight we're proud to offer you our almost live event number 112. These numbers are getting so high, I'm not even sure I can count anymore. <laughs> 112. And it's the Chinatown Opera that we're going to be sharing our all about opera episodes. And this is the Chinatown Opera. So without further ado, I think I'm going to invite into our space our special guest, Julia, who's back with us. Welcome, Julia. Hi, Amy. Hi, everybody. So glad to be here. It's been a while, been a hot minute since you've been here. What, uh, what's been keeping you so busy? Oh, you know, life, but mostly work, 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 right? So. I know, yeah. right? With the, the whole the old nose to the grindstone kind of saying. It's a little bit, yeah. Mm. It's It can be a lot. Um, but you have had the chance to take in this particular opera. Yes. So this is sort of different from what I've done before with, with Vocal Eye in that, you know, past in the past, I've kind of profiled arias or maybe a specific um, event coming up, but that I hadn't actually attended. This time I actually was able to attend it. I attended it in September. So uh, that, and, and just because of how busy I was, uh, that's sort of why I you know, I said, please don't, you know, <laughs> give me a little time to get this together. So here we are in March. But um, no, it was, um, it was a real amazing experience, actually, for me to attend this, because, um, you know, I had known City Opera uh, previously. Um, and, and City Opera is a relatively new um, organization in Vancouver. And uh, so I had known who they were and I admired what they were doing, which was very much um, local, homegrown. Uh, I would say, you know, focusing more on uh, creating new works and that were relevant, let's say, to a different audience, mm -hmm. maybe an audience of opera lovers, but not an audience of people um, that were schooled uh, necessarily in the grand operatic traditions. Right. Um, and this one is, uh, I, I don't want to give the answer. So I'm just gonna ask you, where's this one based? <laughs> <laughs> Gee, <laughs> the story of this one based? <laughs> As, uh, uh, it does reflect the title Chinatown. And, and so the action does take place in Chinatown. But of course, it spans quite a lot of time. It, it goes all the way from, uh, you know, essentially when um, Chinese immigration took place in order to work on the CPR, and then it takes it all the way up into the 60s. So it, it is, um, you know, kind of a, 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 a broad scope, uh, the story. And it, you know, it, it reflects the Chinatown that was then and the more modern Chinatown. And just unpack CPR for folks if they don't know what the acronym means. Ah, Canadian Pacific Railway. Canadian Pacific so Railway. yes, like in the 1890s, um, you know, yeah. there were a lot of um, folks here uh, helping to finish um, building that this the last leg of the Canadian Pacific Railway. You can almost put the word helping in air brackets and air quotes. <laughs> I know. And it's, it's, you know, I talk about it a little bit in the yeah. presentation, but it isn't, you know... <laughs> Helping is yeah one treated, way of putting treated it. poorly and yeah, oh yeah paid yeah. very little and oh yeah not given and, you know Canadian rights and all that kind of stuff yeah and that's that's what this opera aims to kind of address right is all right that. yeah um, I'm I'm interested to you know to sort of get into some of the uh, the, the, the like more detailed plot stuff and character stuff and I know that you're going to share that kind of thing but why how else might this be a bit of a different opera than what we have traditionally seen you bring to the space well the biggest thing is really that this is an opera well first of all it takes place here right in our own city but right. it also uh was conceived to be something that would bring our populations together let's say so you know, uh, obviously, you know, there are a lot of uh, Chinese performers of Western opera out there, and they're very talented. And it's, it's quite actually, it's quite big in China, right, Western opera, but um, 
you know, we don't see them in the numbers that we should here on stage. Representation. That, that's right, representation. So this is this was kind of conceived to address that, and it it absolutely succeeded. And and later on, uh, there will be you know we'll be seeing an interview that I do with the artistic director Charles Barber, who was the one who came up with the idea. Mm-hmm. And you know he talks a lot about the impact that he had. And I mean, everybody involved in this was Chinese, right? Like pretty yeah. much everybody yeah. on the creative team, on the production team, on Nothing the Nothing about us without us that that percolates. Exactly. Yeah. And so the reaction also amongst, especially the older folks in the audience, you know, it was quite moving um, because for a number of reasons, um, Obviously, right? It was their history being told. Mm-hmm. And, the, you know, the history of their loved ones and history of their ancestors. And, and, and it was something that, you know, even for the younger folks, they were, it, it was digging down deeper into their memories of, of their parents, of their grandparents. And, uh, and just to have that actually presented in such a high like with such a high degree of expertise, like the, the people involved in this um, were just at the top of their fields, all of them. And, right. and so um, to have it done so well, it, it, it was, yeah, it was quite meaningful for people, I think. Yeah, and I would imagine, you know, uh, some folks here locally, uh, we saw Forgiveness, which was uh, here at uh, the Stanley Theater, a play that centered around um, uh, Japanese experience in Canada um, during the time of, of, of the war when they were put in internment camps and all that kind of stuff. And, and wh- some of the things that I heard from the impact of people that saw it, and, and I'm talking about the impact of like um, Japanese Canadians, second generation, third generation, is that they said often, you know, my, my parents were a part of that, but they didn't talk about it. Or my grandparents were a part of that, but they didn't talk about it. So in fact, they are, are to some extent learning that bit of history almost, I don't want to say for the first time, but like almost for the first time because their families didn't talk about it it was such a such a difficult time to go through and i wonder if that is if if there's a parallel there with this in terms of 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 generations of families that might have been working on the railroad and i imagine mostly that would be men um but we're coming home to women and families right um that just never talked about it Uh, yeah and and i mean these characters although you know there are specific dates kind of attached to this story. They they aren't they weren't real characters. Like they they weren't real people. They are right. sort of right. archetypes, right? Yeah. Based on events and all the rest of it. Yeah. Um, and yet, I think they probably were relatable for lots of people. Yeah, like, like really lots of people. Yeah. And um, additionally, you know what I noticed is that that was so effective. It, like there were tears. There were lots of tears mm-hmm. in the audience, right? It, and and and. I don't know whether or not it was something that was spoken about in in within their families, but I do know that they, um, you know, they, it 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 inspired discussion after. Pretty sure. Yes. Well, I I, okay. I don't know. I I should have a chalkboard on my wall with the little hash marks on it for how many times I say you know good theater, good art <laughs> provokes conversation, starts yeah. conversation, continues conversation, right? I, I think maybe once an episode I say that and people are probably rolling their eyes in the background, but it's true, right? Yeah. Like good art puts us in a space where we're continuing to have conversations long after we've experienced whatever the art, uh, whatever the art is, right? And, and, and hopefully conversations that are um, productive and polite because <laughs> we're and, all humans right <laughs> and, 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 and I hope to some extent change making mm-hmm. right like there's some kind of action behind some of this stuff because again I've said in a couple of spaces before that I especially around the disability experience we do a lot of a lot of talk and there's not a lot of action mm. um, and so you know talk is important of course but when do we start backing that top up, talk up with action? advocacy yeah. action yeah yeah, yeah. Sure. When, when do we see the change start to happen so 100 yeah yeah so it's 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 part and parcel of of uh, of the experience um and since you've seen this uh you experienced this opera julia um i suppose i should ask you this question later but i'm going to just throw it out there now what was the impact it made on you um well it was i was surprised yeah. um and um it's not that I didn't know the history. I yeah. did know the history. 
but it was, um, well, first of all, and I mean, this is kind of just a little side anecdote, but, you know, obviously every culture has, you know, its own character and its own, you know, uh, sort of uh, understanding of of uh, entertainment and all the rest of it, but uh, you know there were. It, it was just interesting to me because I was sitting in the audience, and there were obviously members of the audience that weren't used to opera, right? The opera audience, right, which is which is quiet and re respectful and all the rest of it, and so that was going on alongside this amazingly intense thing happening on stage right and but it was interesting to me that it it didn't take very long before everything just did kind of focus and settle right. down right. and everybody was pulled in and um i and i'll go into it in a little bit but i mean i thought it was really really effective and and the thing about opera which i know that it's an either kind of i love you or i i love it or i hate it kind of a thing. Right. there aren't too many people that are really in the middle about it um but for those of us that do love it it acts on a on a kind of subconscious level right it's the music it it rings whatever bells in your brain if if it does that and and it does have a very uh just yeah, it, it very visceral response on, on a cellular level, kind of, you yeah, know. Yeah. So uh, I, it's that goosebumpy reaction which I look for when I go to an opera, and I got it. So that was the okay. awesome. Well, where would you like to start, Julia? I mean, this is your presentation you put together, so um, I'm putting putting our our uh, entertainment and our uh, uh, I guess our I just want our hands, our lives. That's extreme. Our lives in your hands. <laughs> But, uh, but you know, we're, we're your captive audience. Okay, right. well, that's great. So I'm, I'm going to be playing some, some clips um, of from the opera. Um, you know, it, and, and um, just a little bit of background first. So I did attend this world premiere of Chinatown in September. And it ended up being not just another night at the opera. So uh, and I'll explain what I mean. So although it was originally intended to be a full production with sets and costumes and movement and lighting and all the rest of it, there, the, the City Opera did have some sort of complications during the production period. And um, a creative choice was made to actually present this opera in concert. So what that means is, in fact, everybody, including the orchestra, was up on the stage. So normally the, the orchestra is in the pit, right? And you're not, you don't see the orchestra. There's the pit in front of the stage. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, they had the orchestra up on the stage so you could watch people playing uh, all their, their instruments. And although they had sort of gestures towards costumes um, and maybe some props, um, and and a little bit of movement. On the whole, it wasn't what you would call a full production. It was in concert. Interestingly, it worked very well. In any case, it it, it didn't really. It, it didn't. I didn't come away thinking th that I'd missed something. So. Um, you know, I, I. It's funny how uh, the creative process can go, where you think, oh, you know. This isn't going to work, but and then it does. So and I in guess some cases, it may even have been more accessible for folks who are blind and partially sighted because there's not a bunch of movement to have to describe. <laughs> there is that too, and <laughs> um, it, you know, the the thing with opera is, of course, oftentimes it's in another language, um, and in this case, it was in another language, and it is kind of a a big part of. Um, of the opera is in Chinese, but it is, it's not in the Chinese that you would recognize in Chinatown right now. Um, and this was one of the interesting things that I learned was that it was actually a dialect that most Chinese immigrants spoke up until the sixties. And that's from a Southern province of Guangdong. Uh, and this is the Hoisan dialect. 
So they actually in there, and 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 this gets covered a little bit in the interview with Charles Barber, but they went it, you know, they had to kind of start from scratch again after a while when they realized, in fact, that they had to be authentic with the language. So um, you know, there were a number of things going on, um, including this kind of mixture of elements. So there's the mixture of the Hoysan dialect and English, and then there was a little bit of Cantonese in there as well. And, and this, you know, despite the fact that it was in, con on, in concert, it ended up kind of working in, in any case. And I think it was a lot because of the mixture of some of these elements. Um, you know, for those that, um, that could see well enough, they had, um, surtitles right which is like subtitles in the movies but above the stage they have translations projected and even the english they had projected up there right. uh, because you know with opera singing sometimes it's hard to understand even if it's in english right so they but they had also um the hoisan up there so they had translations and uh languages to include all of these different elements so, um, and, and in just kind of continuing on with that theme of mixtures of elements, um, they, the music was also a mixture of East and West. So there were combinations um, that you don't always hear together. So that might, would be like classical European instruments from an orchestra together with Chinese traditional instruments like the erhu, which is the stringed Chinese instrument, we'll hear that tonight a little bit. Um, the singing style, well, of course, it is an opera, so it, it was sung it, mostly with a classical opera sound. But because um, Hussain and, and I guess a lot of Chinese languages and dialects um, work this way, but it is sort of like pitched, like the, the, the words don't have the same meaning if they're not pitched properly in, in relation to the words in relation to each other mm -hmm. and so it's kind of musical to begin with right so mm -hmm. um the singing style uh you know was oftentimes reflected um uh, or reflected the chinese language the hoisan dialect um as well um there are theatrical elements that were mixed from both East and West. Um, they, for instance, the Greek chorus that we hear, we sometimes see in, in different um, plays, Western plays is one feature that was in this opera, but it was also combined with what was called a mukyu singer. Um, and this is a, a, a sort of a folk, folk tale song um, like almost troubadour from the Hoysan uh, language. And in this case acts as a narrator throughout the opera. But interestingly enough, it's a narrator that can actually interact with the characters and tell them to do stuff and, <laughs> and, and tell them things. So that, that was kind of fun too. Um, so there were, there was this mixture of elements. Now I, d I do have to, just before we get into the plot, I have to kind of give you a little bit of um, background. The, the, because this work is so new, um, what I'm going to share with you tonight is what I could find on YouTube, which is not, unfortunately, reflective of what I heard at the opera that night. Because although they are recording it, the recording's not done and isn't hasn't been released, so it is unfortunately, you're not going to hear the whole mixture of the orchestra with the Chinese instruments. You will hear it with piano and some Chinese in instruments. Um, additionally, I wasn't able to study the libretto. And then just, just to remind you, libretto is, is the words of the text, right, that is sung. So I'm kind of going on my memory, the program notes, and, and the questions I was able to ask in my interview with uh, Charles Barber. So I'm putting things together as best again as I can to give you a, a sense of of what it was like to be there that night. Um, and I also wanted to make sure before we get into the plot that I just give you a little bit 
um, of, of background on Chinatown, because of course this is the setting, right? This is, we, we need to set the scene. So um, I'm gonna read you a little bit about just a brief history of Chinatown. So Chinese immigrants formed one of Vancouver's two formative settler communities. Chinatown was closely tied to the development of the original commercial core of Vancouver. As Canada's main Pacific port, Vancouver and Chinatown grew quickly together. One of Vancouver's oldest neighborhoods, it is home to important cultural heritage resources with deep roots in Vancouver and Canada. Across 130 years of dynamic change, the district maintains a strong cultural identity. Vancouver's Chinatown was designed an, or sorry, it was designated a National Historic Site in 2012. Chinatown originated with the establishment of the Royal City Planing Mill in 1886 on the block bounded by Corral, Pender, Kiefer, and Columbia Streets. And you'll hear reference to these streets in the opera, which is kind of fun. The mill was built out over False Creek at the foot of Corral, and um, it offered employment to Chinese men. So these workers often lived next to the mill in segregated, long, narrow buildings constructed on pilings in the creek along Corral and Pender. By 1889, there were 29 Chinese businesses, and they were concentrated at Corral and Pender, including five grocers, three general stores, two opium factories, and a shoemaker. Uh, they were surrounded by an industrial landscape of lime kilns, warehouses, building supply depots, wood and coal yards, an ice plant, and a coal gas plant. In 1905, much of the original Chinatown was displaced by the creation of the Great Northern Railway's freight and passenger terminal. Many of the businesses and residents re uh, relocated to a complex of shops and tenements built to the west of Corral by the prominent businessman Yip Seng. Known as New Chinatown, it was home to Canton Alley and Shanghai Alley. Chinatown provided housing and support to the community through associations and societies. Uh, designed for the mutual health cooperation and general welfare, welfare of Chinese immigrants. Um, and you can see the distinctive balconied architecture uh, of uh, the society buildings uh, reflected their Southern Chinese origins. So that's kind of the history of sort of when most of this takes place. So just to kind of get into this story a little bit, so it spans a 70 year history, focusing on the relationship of two families as they navigate tradition, racism, intolerance, and opportunity in their new home. The characters uh, include the Mukyu singer that I spoke of, the narrator, the Greek chorus, which comments on the action, and then the two friends, so Fon Pon Bak and Sai Hin and Sahin's granddaughters, Wenli and Anna, and Eugene, who is the, becomes the, the, the boyfriend lover of Anna. So jumping in here to act one, in 1896 uh, is when the action begins and there's a prologue. And we hear it on aria from this Mukyu singer, the narrator. Uh, who sings in Hoisan, and as I said, who can interact with the main characters. She introduces Fon Pon Bak, who is a boy who uh, has traveled from Hoisan, his home province, uh, to join his father in working on the CPR. And, and I'm going to ask Steph here to um, play a little clip by Paul Yi, who did the translation into um, Hoisan. Um, about this dialect and uh, follow that clip 
with an actual uh, recording of the Hoisan singer, the Mukyo singer, singing this kind of introduction to talk about von Panbach and his journey to Vancouver's Chinatown. And Steph, whenever you're ready. Good evening. Well, the first half of the opera, as you just heard, is sung in Hoisan Va, which was Chinatown's main, main dialect before 1967. It dominated because up until 1949, fully 45% of Chinese immigrants to Canada came from one single county in South China, Hoisan. As Hal said, we use Hoisan Va in the opera to pay homage to the pioneers of our community. We also acknowledge their descendants who, despite being fully Canadianized, still speak the dialect at home. And most important of all, we give voice to tones, sounds, and rhythms that aren't heard in Chinatown anymore because other dialects are now dominant. The first piece that you hear tonight is a song that opens the opera. It is sung by a feisty character called Hoisan Singer. Madeline's story, as you heard, runs from 1890 until 1960. So she uses a narrator, the Hoisan singer, to help audiences make the time jumps and to explain the real events that shape her characters and her plot. What I like about, what I love about the narrator is that she has a distinct personality that gradually emerges over the opera and lets her interact with the other singers on stage. Our Hoisan singer is wise, patient, and playful because being Chinese Canadian has always been very complicated. What I appreciate also about Erica's singing is how she gets the tones right. She isn't a native speaker of Hoisan Va, but she's really worked on getting the dialect. So tonight, if you are going to read the Chinese pictographs on the screen as she sings, you will see that they don't match 100% to the words you hear being sung. And there are two reasons for that. One, in Hoi San Va, which is, which is a spoken dialect, there are many terms that do not have equivalents in Chinese pictographs. Secondly, these surtitles appear in what's known as standard written Chinese, which is the common language understood by all Chinese speakers, no matter which dialect they, they use. And as such, standard written Chinese doesn't really allow for local dialect features. And so without further ado, here is the magnificent mezzo-soprano Erica Iris Huang. Thank you. 
Welcome back, Julia. So that was quite interesting to listen to um, f- because it's in Hoisan. Uh, mm-hmm. I have two questions. One is, what is she singing about? Mm-hmm. Uh, and the second is, do you have any information about how difficult it was to actually find singers that know this dialect? I don't think any of them really spoke it. I don't think that it's commonly heard in Chinatown now. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 most of these singers are like, they're singing nationally and internationally, right? So they're, um, they're Canadian, most of them, Chinese Canadian, but they are, you know, so I, I, I suspect that the ones that did have to sing Hui San uh, were coached on how to sing it, right? right? So that was part of their process. Um, that, that aria that we just heard so it was part of the Mukyu tradition, which was, um, it, it was like, like a troubadour, like somebody telling a story in song. So the narrator kind of introduces the fact that the narrator is going to tell a story and, and it sort of unfolds the story that's about to happen, that it's about a son following in a father's footsteps and that it's a, 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 a two daughters or sisters that are strong like the, the ocean tides, you know? And uh, so it, it really was just a story about, you know, like an aria that was giving a little preview to the story that's about to unfold. Okay. Okay. Well, what's next? Okay. So um, I, I'm going to take you through sort of the, rest of the you know act one uh, which basically is setting the scene of what happens uh, let's say up to world war ii and um unfortunately that was the only aria that we have from the first act but there are there's more when we get into the second act which kind of goes from the end of the second world war um up to the the 60s so, um, so we know that von Pombach and his father have, um, you know, uh, worked on the CPR. Uh, they survive the difficult and sometimes deadly work, mm-hmm. but many do not. And uh, as part of this, what happens next, there's a ceremony which is held to send the souls of those who did not make it back home to their villages aboard a, a ghost train. Um, so that in that was a very nice sort of chorus that we we heard on stage or we in September. Uh, so then we move on and Fun Pan Bak 
continues to work in Chinatown. Um, he is good with numbers. That was one thing that was um, was outlined in that first aria that he's a really good. He's really good with math. So that's what ends up being what he pursues as part of his way to make work. Um, so he works and he works and he um, lives in Chinatown. Some years later, uh, on Chinese New Year in 1920, von Pontbach meets uh, who will become sort of his second family, um, a man named Tsai Hin, who is himself a recent immigrant, also working in Chinatown. They do become close friends and they kind of bond over their shared love of, of numbers and math. Uh, Fon Pon helps Tsai Hin get established, finds him a, a place to live at the Hing Mi House Hotel, which is, was a real building. Um, and that this is where Tsai Hin will live for the rest of his life. So Tsai Hin's background is that he is working there trying to make enough to bring his wife and daughter to join him in, in Vancouver. But it becomes an increasingly difficult task, especially as Canada implements um, a really unjust and onerous head tax to discourage immigration from China. So he works and he works, time passes, and Sahin, despite all of his hard work over many years, is actually unable to make the required amount. And despite the fact that Hon Pon, Hon Pon contributes his own life savings to try to bring these, um, his, uh, his wife and his daughter over, but it's still not enough. And then Canada passes the Exclusion Act, another low point in Canadian history in 1923, which prohibits immigration from China for the next 24 years. Tsai Hin and his dreams of reuniting with his family are crushed. Nevertheless, he struggles on. The Second World War comes and claims millions of victims, including Tsai Hin's wife and daughter. Gratefully, two very young granddaughters do survive, the, the Zahin's daughter's daughters. So they are being cared for by strangers in Hong Kong. And once Canada post-war opens back up to immigration, Zahin uh, wishes to try to bring them back, but he is by this time gravely ill and cannot make the journey to get his family to Vancouver. Bon Pon makes the, pro the promise to his old friend before he dies that he will go impersonate Tsai Hin and bring back the two granddaughters to their home, to their new home in Vancouver. And this is kind of one of the themes of this work is a little bit of impersonation. Um, that is to say, having to try to be somebody other than you are, that, that I feel runs as a theme through, uh, through this opera, because, you know, unfortunately, it was a rather dicey thing to be a Chinese immigrant. And you, you had to learn how to, to work um, and to be something acceptable to the other settler community in Vancouver. So that brings us to the end of act one. And at this point in, to, into the second act, we move ahead in time to 1961 in, to the Strathcona neighborhood. Uh, so the sixties were a time of great change and conflict Sahin has died, and Fon Pon is has retrieved his granddaughters in and is caring for them as his own. The, his two daughters are now in, uh, sorry, the two granddaughters are now in high school. This is Wen Li and Anna, and together they are their own kind of family. Now, despite their closeness, the two granddaughters, Wen Li and Anna are two very different people. 
with different feelings about Chinatown and their own place in it. Wen Li is very attached to Chinatown and loves every part of it. She has a plan. Her grandfather's plan, uh, as she was told, which was that she would go to university and following the love of math, <laughs> become a theoretical physicist. I have to say that's the first time I've ever heard those words in an opera, <laughs> theoretical <laughs> physicist. So right now we are going to play Wen Li's aria and uh, this is in English and it's my favorite aria from the opera. And uh, Steph, whenever you're ready. Okay. Yeah. So you we hear a little bit more of like the kind of the Western classical type opera that we know. Yes. Yeah. And um, that was Vanya Chang singing, and she has this beautiful, clear, uh, light soprano, and 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 is so well suited to portraying a young girl. You know, um, 
uh, and in this aria, you know, she she talks about how she just loves Chinatown and she does not want her sister Anna to leave. Um, and that is sort of one of the big conflicts that comes out in the opera is this sense of are we safe in Chinatown, safer than we would be away? When Lee believes, yes, that it's better to stay. It's better to stay as a, as a family, as a community, mm -hmm. and weather whatever happens together. Right. But Anna has a different plan, has different opinions. She's an art lover, and she has taken to photography. And she's also fallen in love as it turns out, a dangerous love because her boyfriend is what's called a paper son. So a paper son uh, was, you know, a, a man, uh, a male immigrant who had illegal papers, that is, had not, did not have legal status in Canada. Mm. And at this time, uh, well, I mean, his family, had sacrificed everything to attain these illegal papers right. and to send him to Canada, you know, to establish a new, better life. And of course, you know, things in China were not great at, at this time. So it was seen as worth the sacrifice, um, despite the fact that it was basically just meant plucking somebody out of their family and they'd never see their family again right. they were sort of placed in another family right so he um he and anna though meet at their classmates and they fall in love and because of his status and the concern because chinatown was was coming under increasing scrutiny especially around this issue of illegal immigration and there were raids and um, arrests. And um, uh, when Lee and Anna's and, and von Bonbach actually keep Eugene and hide him from the authorities. Mm -hmm. um, but this duet sort of talks about a, a little bit of the lighter part of, the, of their, um, their courtship but then also their discussions about, you know, their plans of what, what can they do? Can they stay in Chinatown where there's so much attention to, to, to things like false papers um, or should they go elsewhere? So uh, Steph, whenever you're ready, you can play the next clip, which is a duet between Anna and Eugene. In, uh, in this scene, um... Eugene is has been chased around um, and and uh, is running away from the immigration police, and thankfully has been taken in by Anna and her family. And in hiding, they start to th talk about how they met, and their possible plan pan plans. Sorry, their possible plans for the future. hundred pages nearly broke my back pictures survive remember von Pombach will hide you he said you are one of us I 
have to get away tomorrow. tomorrow I'll go I'll with the police. Check my papers. Oh, yes. Clear water. This street will be gone. Chinatown in ruins. This was never our home. A different life. I need to find it. Every time I take a photo, I hold the light before it's gone. Thon Buck has dreams for us. Last year I sent my photos out looking for work. The landform tracing project. You and I. If we're together, together, but Thon Pon Bop. He said university is all that matters, all that, that matters. I found this in the Hing Me. It's Thon Pon Bop. Isn't it? Thon Pon Buck and Grandfather Sigh. We are scattered here, Eugene. Best friends forever together. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is them against the world, right? Yeah. So yeah. Um, quite a quite a contrast between the two sisters and and of course Eugene, you know, I think as much as he appreciates being in Canada, he's really ambivalent about Canada. Mm -hmm. and, and mostly because he does not like this feeling of that he's not really a part of the place that he lives. Um, that even the term paper son, which he is, kind of denotes, um, you know, nothing of substance, right? right? He's not really a real thing, a real person. Yeah. But he does know that he belongs with Anna. And, and so that is the thing that kind of uh, anchors him to, to the place. And if she goes, He's fine to go to. Mm -hmm. So we'll actually hear now Eugene's aria, where he talks a little bit more about this. Um, and Steph, whenever you are ready, go ahead and roll. It feels like rain, doesn't it? <laughs> I want to build a house. Sent me 
Send me away from all to buy my false papers, cost her everything. I became another name, another boy, another. I grew up, I grew up with my paper father in a paper house. I ran down paper steps, climbed paper trees, But I know was real, but I know was real. Moi kini voi sing, sai ko pon pon go. Okay, that was Eugene's aria, and uh, I, really beautiful pieces. But you know, what's he reflecting on there, Julia? If folks weren't able to pick up on the on the English. Well, it, it, sort of what I was saying before, yeah. where he, you know, he he has this sense of unreality that 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 he you know he 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 was lived in a paper house. He climbed paper trees as a kid. He learned to love a paper ocean. Like it, it's. Yeah it's all unreal to him yeah and and it had something to do it i came think at great sacrifice 
Yes, uh, it, and, yeah. and he was, you know, I think there was this understanding of, of a sacrifice made for your family back home. Mm -hmm. And he would, he would send home, you know, uh, bits of money when he could, mm -hmm. but never culturally feeling like he fit. Yeah. You know, there's this moment in the aria where he talks, he speaks in Hoisan, and all of a sudden it just kind of, he just frees out right up. Like it's just him now. And, he, and, and then he switches back to English. And again, it's, there's a kind of a, a switch to a, a more um, just a separate, a sense of separation from what's around him. And that, that he's a paper bird and a paper sky, mm -hmm. but that with Anna, he feels real. And so, and, and he knows he has to be brave just like Anna is brave. Uh, in order to create a life together, the two of them somewhere else other than Chinatown. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, one last musical clip. Um, and so as, as was mentioned, immigration um, had become a flashpoint in Vancouver and across Canada during the 60s. Um, the city was demolishing parts of Chinatown, pulling down people's homes, is bent on finding Ill illegal immigrants and sending them back to China. So the police raid families' homes, leaves them, leave them in disarray, is hunting for people. And among those buildings uh, slated for demolition was the Hingmi house where Saihan uh, Sai, Sai lived. And, um, you know, it, it's again another signal that there's nothing kind of solid underneath their feet. Mm -hmm. um, so e Eugene is is hidden during these nightly raids. They protect him from the authorities. But as these tensions increase around them, the two sisters do have to come to terms with each other and their different paths. Anna doesn't see a future for herself and Eugene in Vancouver. And so, you know, they they make this this very difficult decision to leave. And she and Anna have this last duet where they, you know, they come to, to peace. They, they, they get some peace from this decision. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's kind of a, a beautiful moment where um, Anna and Wen Li uh, in, envision their lives in 10 years together. And you know, Anna knows that as long as she and Eugene are together, but she doesn't know exactly what they're going to do. <laughs> uh, you know, she, she knows that they'll be fine as long as they're together, but they'll, they'll, they'll figure it out as they go. And then Wenli has this very established plan. So um, she understands, Wenli understands why Anna has to go. She's still not quite, quite happy about it, but she loves, she loves Anna. She, but she also loves her home too much to, to give up to it. And she wants to stay and go to university and fight for her right to be here in Vancouver, here in Chinatown, here in Canada. Mm -hmm. So in this duet, you'll hear Wenli and Anna talking about what their lives will be like and how even though they'll, they'll be apart, they'll always be together in their hearts. So step whenever you're ready. We can play this final duet from Wendy and Anna. Almost ten o'clock. Uncle Toy will be here soon. Anna, I can see the future. Okay, little fortune teller, tell me. Ten years from now, it's 1971. You're ancient. 28 years old Like this Stand up straighter You have seen The distant land The distant land And you're a photographer A real one No more slouching Finally you have come home No. 
physicians. Oh, oh, a physician. A theoretical physicist. Wow. And Von Pombach, you look so well. <laughs> I'll show you my office. Look at all my books. But we are happy to see you. Why can't I stay and live? No, I understand you can't stay. You, you have to go back to Okay, so this is their, their understanding of what life is holding for them at this point. And basically then the opera sort of ends with Pon Pon Bak, their sort of adopted grandfather, um, and every other character, including the chorus on stage and after this long life, von Pannbach sees the ghosts of his father and Saihin, his sort of adopted family, and the grandfather of Wendy and Anna. And he talks about how they talk about, they sing a duet, the, the ghost of Saihin and von Pannbach, about how they did the best they could to be true to what they loved and that included family, traditions, culture, but also to their new country. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lovely sort of moving, uh, you know, tribute to the past and the future. So, and that's how the opera ends. And I, I do have one more clip, which includes a, a, an interview with the artistic director um, I just wanted to do a quick moment here to, to point out the creative team here. The composer, Alice Ping Hiyo, um, who is a, um, I'm sorry, Alice Ping Yi Ho, who was the composer and she's a Canadian as well and is recorded all over and very, very busy with um, uh, more work for orchestras all over the world. Um, as well, Madeleine Tien wrote the libretto. She, this is her first opera, but of course she's a, well, they're all award-winning. There's a very illustrious creative team here. But of course people may know her from her recent novel, Do Not Say We Have Nothing, that won the Scotia Giller Prize and the Governor General's Award for Literature in the English language. And 
then Paul Yi, who we heard, uh, who translated into the Hoisan, which not everybody knows how to do these days. Uh, and again, he's also, he's had a 30 year career, uh, primarily in children's literature, interestingly enough, but it was also a very award-winning um, author of um, poetry and picture books and even books on Vancouver's history, including one called Saltwater City. So I, I, I think you'll get from the next, this last video, a sense of how it was received. And um, Steph, if you would like to go ahead, this is the artistic director of City Opera, Charles Barber. And, and this one's about 25 minutes long, so. Right. Heads up about that. Awesome. Before we get into too much detail, I just wanted to ask you, uh, Charles, if you would introduce yourself quickly and also City Opera Vancouver and, and what its mission is. Sure. Uh, my professional name is Dr. Charles Barber. I hold master's and doctoral degrees in music from Stanford University. Music is my life. It is my career. It is my profession. And it is my joy to have served uh, since 2006 as artistic director of City Opera Vancouver. I'm shortly, in fact, retiring. And we are now in the process of running a national search for my successor. Um, City Opera is a professional chamber opera company. We specialize in the small forms. We specialize in a kind of intimate eloquence and we emphasize Canadian themes and artists. And Chinatown the Opera is very much part of that long-term agenda on the part of City Opera. And in that context, uh, City, City Opera is very pleased that Chinatown, uh, which has now closed, but which will be opening elsewhere, we trust in the near future, um, had a very successful five-night run and is the fifth new opera that we have commissioned in the years since our company has been in business. A final word about that. We, as a chamber opera company, specialize in those small forms. If one wants to think of grand opera as elephants and pyramids, then we do butterflies and mice. <laughs> it's a question of scale. It is a question of impact. And it is, as I mentioned before, a question of what for us is an intimate eloquence that is possible in the forms and the venues that we pursue and offer. Wonderful, thank you, that's great. Um, so getting down into that then a little bit, your commissioning of this particular opera, can you tell us what made you decide on this subject? Uh, I came up with the idea in the summer of 2017 thought it through, talked it through with friends and colleagues, presented it to our board a couple of months later. The board unanimously endorsed it as what became our fifth commission. And the reason for it was, I think, uh, elaborate. Uh, it's not a simple story. It's not a simple issue. It was not as straightforward as a couple of other projects that we've done. But rather in this case, uh, we were telling or intended to tell uh, an historical story through fictional characters. Characters whose lives, characters whose personalities, characters whose import would suggest the broader ideas and themes of the opera, which were these first, to tell a story about a great neighborhood, its people and its families, to tell thereby a story about Canada and how Canada was built and how the men in this instance who came to us from Guangdong province in China in the 19th century to build the CPR, contributed vastly and importantly to the fact that Canada exists today. And most particularly that British Columbia is in Canada and not in the United States of America, which it could have been. And thirdly, to deal as directly and as coherently as we might with the sordid and undisputed fact of racism as experienced by initially the men and finally the men and families who came here to build the country. We wanted their labor, but we didn't want them after they were done. We wanted them to be here, but we didn't want their wives and children to be here. So much was that the case that Canada passed not only a series of head taxes to charge exorbitant fees for the privilege of working on the railway, 
But we also passed in 1923 an Exclusion Act. That was its actual name, an act to exclude Chinese from Canada. And that law was enforced in, in our country uh, for about a quarter century until ultimately its repeal. We wanted to deal with those issues as well. So the time and place of a great neighborhood, the story of people who came to build the country, and the further story of how they were treated once we finished using them. These are important and necessary, honorable and honest stories in the Canadian context. Canada is a great country. I am enormously proud to be Canadian. In the course of my life, I've had the privilege of working in other countries and on other continents. And every time I have come back home, it is with a renewed pride in what we have achieved. Even so, we can always do better and be better. And we cannot accomplish either of those goals without acknowledging our own history, our own mistakes. Think residential schools, for example, yeah. which must at the time a century ago somehow have seemed like a good idea. But today, of course, we acknowledge that it was a dreadful idea. Right. City Opera commissioned a work in regard to that as well called Missing. In the case of Chinatown, that's why we did it. That's what we attempted to do. And that is what I think our audience came to discover that we did do. Right. And I know you've had really, really great reaction to it. And as someone who was born in Vancouver and has become more recently interested in Vancouver history, to have the privilege to see this opera about the, the city that I live in and to discover more about, about that, um, well, it's given me a, a lot more to think about. And certainly it's also, I don't know, just put a, a different personality in the, the place, which mm -hmm. I think is, is wonderful. And I'm so, so glad that I saw it. And I know that you've heard a lot about that from your audience. Um, in that regard as well. Um, so in 2017, you had this idea and then you decided to develop it and make the commission. And then somewhere in there, a pandemic hits. So <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about how that was for you? Oh, it was a nightmare. <laughs> it was just awful. Yeah. But we claim no singular victimhood. Everyone was struck with the same problem. <laughs> it yeah. certainly justified to us. Um, the, the opera was to have been performed a year before it actually went up. Okay. Uh, we were delayed by COVID and by the implications of it. Uh, in fact, during the immediate rehearsal and production run, three of our most important personnel came, all came down with COVID. Oh. Um, uh, one of our singers uh, was uh, f felled by it. Uh, we had six leads and a dozen members of a chorus, plus another dozen in a community chorus. And one of the six leads was uh, badly hit by COVID and had to leave or had to stay out of the entire performance. And of course, part of the problem with this disease is that everyone is afraid someone else is going to give it to them. Yeah. And so the necessity for extreme hygienic practices was very important to us. Even so, three people came down with it, but luckily, the other 70 did not. Right. That yeah. said, it did um, afflict in, in many ways what we intended. As you know, we ultimately ended up giving the work in staged concert form rather than in the complete form with costumes and props and sets that we had originally intended and paid for. Yes. And because we were unable to meet certain of the musically logistical demands of this show, uh, we ended up having to make the choice we did. It still turned out to be a very good choice. And indeed, the review in the Vancouver Sun, which was a dazzling review, mm -hmm. uh, offered the point that precisely because we did not have costumes and sets and props, but because the music was given entirely, mm -hmm. the orchestra was now on stage. Yep. And there was an order of emotional directness about it that was not filtered or impeded by the mechanics of theater. So in a sense, although that was not what we originally intended, it is what we ended up having to do. And it worked very well. And the review in the sun said so very directly that people were able to concentrate. So would you personalities and the music 
and not be distracted potentially by uh, lighting and other effects. W would you say that if it were to be performed again, that that experience might inform the next presentation of it? Do you think it would be conceived of differently? Um, well, if, if our friends in Toronto go ahead with it, they wish to do the performance as originally conceived, props, mm -hmm. sets, and costumes. Mm -hmm. No one proposes to change a note or a word of the piece. Mm -hmm. It's musical competence, it's musical transcendence was wonderful. Yes. And unless Alice, our composer, decides that she wishes to make some further changes, which is of course her right and privilege, what any future audience will see is the engine of the piece, which is the superb musicality of this work and the extraordinary definition of characters as they live among one another, as they interpenetrate, as they shape a neighborhood and families over time. This, of course, is the greatness of opera. We can do this sort of thing. <laughs> and um, I, I would hope that in future productions, uh, and there will be some, we don't know exactly when and where, but we've had a lot of interest, that future productions will consider either option. But it would certainly going to be a wonderful thing to see it as wholly and originally conceived and as well to keep in mind that the music is so strong yes it also works as a staged concert version exactly yeah no that was that was really interesting for me to see because going in i knew that it had been changed that way and mm -hmm. and then to have it work so well was a surprise um and and a pleasant surprise at that so <laughs> Um, so, okay, so our, our audience today knows we've covered a bit about the plot and how it's uh, constructed, um, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the libretto, the structure of the libretto and the different languages used and um, why. Why do we have um, the libretto in the languages that we do? Well, uh, as you know, uh, Chinatown, the opera, is in two acts and uh, ten scenes, uh, basically five scenes per act. That's the essential uh, architecture of the piece. It's about two families. It's set uh, ostensibly in uh, 1961, I think it is, but it pivots in time back and forth. It moves in time as do the characters move through their lives. It is about two families. It's about the interrelationships of those families. And in the ancient Greek sense of theater, there is also a chorus that both comments upon and participates in the action. And in that sense, we follow the verities of traditional opera. But what's new about this is that the orchestra is like the story, fluently bilingual. Mm -hmm. We use Chinese traditional instruments and Western traditional instruments. We sing in English, occasionally in Cantonese, but significantly, perhaps 40% of the dialogue is in Hoisan. When we began the work, and this is what we learned through the many, many workshops that City Opera does when we create a new piece, we discovered we had gotten it wrong. Our initial thought was that the secondary language of the piece would be Cantonese. But when we took it to the workshops, over and over again, Chinese folks who came to the workshops in hundreds of numbers, and especially among elders, said, no, when our grandfather came here, he did not speak Cantonese. He spoke a dialect of Cantonese called Hoisan, or occasionally other dialects like Hakka, for example. But principally in Vancouver, historically, perhaps as many as 90% of the men who came here in the 19th century did not speak Cantonese, but rather a specific dialogue from one of the four counties in southern China called Guangdong. That instructed us a great deal, Julia. That told us a lot about how we had to reconsider the piece. And so we did. And we spent a good deal of time and money in reverting. Uh, Madeline Tian, who wrote our libretto, wrote it in English. And we had, at the very first workshop, a sequence in Cantonese to give people an idea of what it might sound like. And then they said, no, you've got it all wrong. So we quickly adapted. And we engaged a wonderful, uh, as Maddie calls him, co-writer by the name of Paul Yi, who wrote a marvelous book in Vancouver about our history 
uh, called Saltwater City and put on an exhibition at the time, this many years ago. Uh, so Paul gave us the Hoisan version of it, which then of course had to be coached in another very elaborate set. Um, almost our entire cast was Chinese. Um, there was one white role, all the rest of the roles are, are uh, definitively and nominally Chinese. And uh, none, and not one person in our cast actually spoke Hoisan. Uh, only two spoke Cantonese. So we, even though they were all Chinese folks, uh, wonderful Canadian Chinese artists. And so we had to invest a good deal in coaching and language uh, and language tapes and all the rest of it. But the whole point was validated, we think, by the response that we got. So many people came up afterwards to me and to others in the company. So many people phoned and wrote afterwards and said, words to the effect, I paraphrase, but I think do so fairly. I never imagined I would hear my story and I never thought it possible that I would hear it in Hoisan, which is the language of my family. You know, 40%, 40% of the people of Vancouver now are of Asian descent. 40% must be made to feel and to be in reality welcome at such events. And we did everything we could think of to ensure that those folks would come to hear their story told in their language, sung in their way, given in their city. And I think the response you described demonstrates that it can be done, but it is not an overnight labor and COVID most certainly complicated it in a way we never, ever expected. Absolutely. And of course, this opera is quite unique in that respect, right? In terms of the Hoisan uh, language being presented and, and those stories being told uh, of, of generations past, that, that does inspire that reaction amongst younger people now where they, they see it and they hear it and then they're transported back to their, their childhood perhaps mm -hmm. and maybe not even realizing how much they were yearning to see themselves represented on stage. We learned this in workshops, we learned it in rehearsals. Overwhelmingly we were taught it during the five nights of the show. I would think, judging crudely, superficially by appearances and surnames on tickets ordered, uh, that about half our audience at the Vancouver Playhouse was Chinese of Chinese descent. And one of the things that was most moving and most telling about the response to Chinatown the Opera was the appearance clearly of grandparents walking in with grandchildren, sharing their story in a way that was never before possible and in a way that treated them, I believe, with enormous respect and affection. Lovely. It, it meant the world to us. Uh, Alice Ping Yi Ho is our composer. And this story is in part as well, Alice's story. Mm -hmm. uh, Mary Chun uh, was our conductor. It is also her story. Uh, Mary told me after I think our second phone call when I, I called her to offer her the position of conductor and music director for the piece, that her own father, she discovered later in life, was a paper son. Mm. Her own father. Mm. You can imagine Mary's response to that part of the story being told. And so it went. And so it goes. And so it will, we hope, endure. And I was wondering about that because, of course, I, I'm wondering if such a, a group of illustrious artists, and they, they really do have, each of them, quite an impressive resume. Mm -hmm. Did they ever dream they'd have a chance to work together like this? No, on such a no this, was, this was a first. Yeah. Uh, no one had done this before. We've not heard of any other company attempting this, but for City Opera, this is normal. This is what we do. This is why we exist. It is to tell stories of consequence that no one else has told, and to tell them with sufficient discipline and artistry and impact that they come to mean something to people. And we've certainly learned already that Chinatown has had enormous meaning to its audience. And this is because I think the people who created the piece and who sang the piece and who produced the piece 
uh, took a great deal of honorable time and trouble to listen, to get it right, to change when we did not get it right. And we made many changes. Mm -hmm. And in the ultimate evening of the event, to make people feel that they were at home. Part of the mission further of City Opera as a company has always been to desnutify <laughs> the experience of opera, <laughs> because we are well aware that we have a terrible reputation for being elitist, for being out of touch, for being exclusively the property of people who look like you and me with a million bucks in the bank. Mm -hmm. And that is not, in fact, the story of opera at all. That's not remotely how and why opera exists. But we acknowledge it as a fact, and we attempt to change the fact on the ground by the stories we tell in music, in theater, in opera, and by the audiences that we seek and welcome and I hope gratify. Wonderful. Um, Charles, do you have like a favorite memory from this show, from the whole process? I think it was closing night and the longest standing ovation our company has ever earned. Mm -hmm. And then to see as the lights came up, wet eyes mm -hmm. shining in the dark, shining in response. You, you mentioned also an interaction with a, with a patron uh, who, who was an older gentleman and he, mm -hmm. he, he just kind of needed you to know something, right? He... Yeah, it, it, I don't believe I knew the man. Mm -hmm. uh, I was in the lobby um, greeting people as they came in and thanking them as they left. And an older fellow, about my size, I'm 6'2", I'm I weigh 220, um, about my size came up and he was Chinese and he asked if he could give me a hug and he held it unusually long mm -hmm. and he said something personal that I would not rather uh, repeat in public because he may have given it to me as a as a private statement but it was very clear from the embrace from his broken voice from the length of that hug that he on behalf of his family, on behalf of his culture, on behalf of his, his inheritance, was terribly, terribly moved by what he had seen. And his way of saying thanks was to ask in a broken voice, may I give you a hug? Mm -hmm. And of course, I was honored to receive it and to reply in kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, Julia, it was, uh, marvelous and yet because so many people responded that way not altogether a surprise clearly <laughs> clearly what Alice and Maddie and Paul had conceived what our wonderful singers had given what our splendid orchestra had offered it rang and it rang true and it sang and it sang true you can hope for no more in opera the power of, of opera and theater you know made made real right there so that that's really wonderful and I'm, I'm i know you said that it has been recorded and um you, there's a potential that we'll actually be able to hear the whole thing um at some point in the future correct well very much um the two days immediately following the close of the show in september of 2022 we went into the recording studio with the original cast uh the original orchestra the original conductor uh, and we recorded it, uh, the entire of it, audio, uh, not video, audio. Mm -hmm. uh, that recording was made at that time. It has since been edited. Uh, the editing has now been concluded. And uh, we are now in the process of mastering the work and of concluding our arrangement uh, with the distributor that will be putting the work out. If it all comes together, if COVID never comes back, if nothing else goes awry, if squirrels don't fall out of the trees and land on our heads, <laughs> um, we hope to be able to release it in September of this year. It will be an audio recording and it will, we hope, be widely available. Wonderful. And, and we'll just kind of stay tuned uh, to the City Opera website, I presume, for, for news on that. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Um, any upcoming plans that you can share uh, about what City oh. Opera is planning next? Our next main, well, we do concerts throughout the year. Uh, in the last 17 years, we've given just over 270 concerts in Vancouver. 
72 of them in the downtown east side, we are very proud to say. Our next main stage production is a one-man show written by an immensely gifted Canadian tenor composer artist named Isaiah Bell. Isaiah is a tenor of, of terrific reputation and he's written a one-man show. It's semi-autobiographical. It's a very tough piece. It's a difficult piece. It's a charming piece. It's uh, a piece of some agony and some delight. It's mostly Isaiah's actual story, and we are putting it up on May, excuse me, on May 18, 19, and 20 at the Playhouse Theater, the Playhouse Arts Center in the downtown east side at Gore and Cordova, uh, diagonally opposite St. James Anglican Church. And this is all coming out uh, on the City Opera website. If you go there today, you will actually see it today, okay. but we're making the big official announcement in a couple more days, uh, probably by the time this comes out. And uh, it's um, a, a very strong piece, um, uh, four players, one singer, and a story, the elements of which will be fairly familiar and aspects of which will, I think, be brand new. So that's the next City Opera main stage, The Book of My Shames, by its composer and singer, Isaiah Bell. Wow, that sounds really intriguing. Uh, well, thank you very much. I. Um so appreciate your taking the time today to talk to us. We are, you know, just learning a lot of us are learning about opera period and the, uh, you know, the fact of having somebody uh, do an opera in English and in other languages spoken, uh, you know, around us and around the world um, that we can relate to in a different way. It's not, it doesn't happen every day. So really appreciate you taking the time today to talk to us. Okay, that was recorded Julia doing a uh, interview with Dr. Charles Barber and now we have Julia back live in the virtual <laughs> space. Um, it was a very interesting uh, interview and a lot of really rich history and, and commentary in there. So I appreciate both you and Charles taking the time to, to provide that for us. Um, I am curious about, so the way that these, Okay, so the, you had mentioned that this was done in concert when you saw it in September, the fact that that had the orchestra on the stage, but the clips that we saw didn't have all the orchestras and some of them look like they were shot in somebody's living room. <laughs> um, right? I mean, it's kind of so can you I mean, like, how, how, why are these clips different than what the reality was? Yeah, so um, these clips were done probably to promote the opera. So they're, they're, they probably predate September. And, um, you know, opera is very expensive. And one of the reasons why it's expensive is that you have to pay all these people, right? So, and so in order to actually put um, the clips from the actual opera, Mm -hmm. they would have to pay every single person in the orchestra all the residuals and yeah. yeah so at some point when the full recording is available it, i'm sure city opera will put some of those th those clips on their website so that you can actually enjoy what it sounds like but right now this is these are arrangements from the the score for piano and some of those instruments can you talk about some of the different instruments that were used i mean we i think everybody heard the piano recognizes the piano but there are some instruments that that i didn't recognize maybe more traditionally eastern instruments but maybe you could talk about some of those yeah so the ahu is the the sort of the you know the star of uh, of of what we heard right it's that stringed instrument um it's i love the ahu. it's so i find it um just an incredibly expressive instrument like like many string instruments are and of course these instruments are really old like they've been around a long time <laughs> and in addition to the erhu uh, some of the the percussion instruments uh, there's an ocarina that's a, a kind of a flute um, as well um, that's basically like a hollowed out rock and it, it was featured in the show we didn't hear it tonight unfortunately but um, you know all of these instruments are sort of typically part of 
uh, you know, Chinese ensembles. And um, well, of course, you know, they, they have a classical tradition of their own, right? So um, I unfortunately, like I said, I wasn't able to study the score or or, or the libretto. So I, I couldn't tell you exactly what was in mm -hmm. the orchestral version of it. Uh, Donna had texted me uh, during the uh, the interview with a fun fact, and it, it, there was something that was sort of nagging in the back of my mind about one of the voices that we heard tonight, mm -hmm. and uh, the gentleman that plays Eugene was in the production of The Cave that some of us saw just mm -hmm. recently here in Vancouver at the College Theatre, um, and I was like, Eric. oh, you know, yeah, I was like, I totally recognize that voice, but I couldn't put it into context, and now, now I feel like I can breathe. <laughs> Yeah, yes. and I was like, yay, fun fact, I love that. So thanks to Donna for always having my back. Appreciate that one. Yeah, he. I think he has more of a history in music theater, I think. Yeah. And and so, you know, he has an amazing voice and clearly has had some some training, um, you know, but I, I, I suspect, yeah, that he lives more in the music theater world. For sure, yeah. We may see him over and over in other things as they as they come up, you never know. The city is small that way. Yes. In a lot of respects. And the country too. <laughs> and the country. And the country. Yeah. The industry. Um, friends, if you have questions for Julia, if you want to share comments about what you experienced tonight, um, you know, this is your time to to pipe on in and oh, we already have a hand. I don't even have to say much. We already have a hand. Um and then Julia and I'll just keep on chatting um in, until we uh we run out of time or have more hands. So Megan is up first. Give Megan a moment to unmute. That was an amazing. It was rather moving too, but I love the language. And I it was really, really, really amazing. Um, um it kind of reminded me of the musical Paper Hearts, the one musical that I actually saw at the Edinburgh French Festival. It was about these Russian families moving to the UK during the first and second world war, which is amazing, and I loved it. Um, and so I was wondering, is Charles Barker, Dr. Charles Bar Barker, is he going, uh, is he going uh, to write um, a an opera about uh, the Japanese uh, side? Because the Japanese came earlier as well, right? Ah. Well, I mean, just to be clear, uh, Charles Barber. Uh, he's the artistic director of the, the company. He didn't actually write this opera, but um, you know he's a conductor. So you know, and and very very much um, you know a, a trained um, musician. So he probably could write an opera. But you know, it's it's an interesting idea because of course there are there's a big Japanese history in Vancouver as well, and I think it's a fantastic idea. So mm -hmm. and also India too, because there's a little a little India as well. No, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's a very rich, uh, you know, tapestry of histories in Vancouver. And, and you know, like I, I was born here and I grew up here, but uh, I don't know. It's like, not, these, these stories are not necessarily part of our educational, um, no. the fabric and, of our educational system. And maybe when about the, the First Nations of how the, the, how the settlers came and, and, and the, yeah. So many stories, right? So and, oh, many stories to tell. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And the British. Don't forget the British and the British came. <laughs> yeah. Hard to forget them. <laughs> uh, oh, come on. My grandpa is, is British. So, so is my grand. So is my grand. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they were, they were both British, too. Um, And the second one was, uh, oh, what was it now? So, uh, it was, um, um, the second one was, when you talk about the ghost train, does it sound Buddhist or is it more the religion of the Chinese gods? You know, I don't actually know if it's rooted in a religious tradition that it was a ceremony, but unfortunately I, I didn't ask Charles about that. I should have, because uh, I'm curious too um, about what, and, and I saw this, right? I, I saw it, but it wasn't described. <laughs> and even though like I was able to read some of the text and, uh, you know, obviously some program notes and stuff like that, I was able to access, but 
there just isn't enough known about the opera yet, right? Like I, I had one kind of chance to see it. And so I, I remember it as being a beautiful, a beautiful moment musically, but I, I don't have a, a lot of context about what that, um, what that actually meant. I think, it, I think it reminded me of the, um, I think it was in, in, in the Guang province, yes. Um, I, I think it was at the resident of the Miao people, the Yao people. What they would do is they would, um, I guess, um, around the grave, they would actually would give people ghost money. And mm -hmm. they, would, uh, they would do that. So, yeah. It it's funny how many like, cultures do that, hey? Yeah. Yeah. Where they, they actually, like even the ancient Egyptians, right? Like they would send send people on their journey to the afterlife with with tools and money and food and all the rest of it. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Megan, thank you so much for your questions and your thoughts. Appreciate it. You're that. welcome. Um, we've got Sean and Christy, then we've got iPhone, um, and then we've got Lori. So we'll we'll see if we can identify who iPhone um, is. Sean and Christy are up. Christy, um, sounds like it's Christy. Yeah. It's always me. Uh, <laughs> She's the intellectual one over here. I'm the intellectual. No, I'm okay. I'm also the um, non-white one. I uh, guess. That too, yeah. So I, I, you know, whenever I, I hear immigrant stories profiled on on, on vocal eye, it's always really cool because, of course, representation. We hear a lot of white stories, and um, it's always very educational to hear about immigrants. Um, I know one of the things that I don't know, and this is my perception of Canada, is that because, uh, you know, when you said, you know, you weren't taught a lot about other cultures in school. And I grew up where I grew up in the Caribbean, we were taught about every other culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the one thing I noticed when I like growing up in Canada and even now I'm like how can Canadians not know their own history uh -huh. like you know it, it's it, it floors me still um and uh I, I I've been doing some research about Asian Canadians for a course that I'm helping out with and uh I like the one artist said that we're all composed of multiple narratives um and it she used that analogy of shifting sands like you can feel unsettled in a country but all that separates us from asia and we think it oh but we're foreigners um is water and sand and that sand goes washes back and forth from shore to shore so it's we like we're all the same and i think there needs to be more of an effort to appreciate and learn authentically about other cultures and other histories because it's it's just part of who we are we don't live in a bubble right mm. um so yeah just as i mean i'm 31 years in canada this year uh and it's still it still floors me how i don't know i I don't know if it's oblivious or I don't want to say ignorant because there are people who honestly want to learn about different cultures, but I find a lot of, and I'm talking about white, I guess, settler Canadians being sort of ambivalent, I guess, to other cultural histories. So just, just putting it out there that it's a cool educational opportunity for everyone to indulge in. Yeah. To do and, that. And, and I, and I, um, I think that what was really cool about this event for me was to realize how important it was to he for for this group, like our neighbors, our Chinese Canadian neighbors um, that were in the theater that night to see themselves on stage, right? To see their history That's on right. stage and to see themselves yeah. represented as we've as we've noted several times, right? And I mean, I don't understand in, their in the traditional same way. language and that touched yeah. me, that, exactly. that traditional way. And, and, and not just, yeah. you know, like the language of their forebears, right? Their, their ancestors. That's right. right. Which, yeah, it's, yeah not it's, the colonized sort of version. It, it, yeah. yeah. And, and it's an authentic, as you say, it's an authentic sort of folk bit, rooted, rooted language, right? So That's right. that was yeah. very, very cool. Yeah. Thank you for your comment there. 
Okay, thanks, Christy. So who is iPhone? iPhone is up next. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. yeah, it's it's Susan McAndrew. Ah, Susan, welcome. I um I don't know why my phone says iPhone, but anyway. <laughs> um I was so touched by that. Like um when I've when I've walked in Chinatown, not not that often, but I visited somebody at their house once. We were visiting their parents or something a few years ago. And like you know, it's a whole a whole different culture. And when, you know, the song they mentioned Kiefer Street and Carroll Street and all that, it's like, I've walked there. Mm -hmm. And it's it's and I find that that Chinese violin, mm -hmm. it is so soulful. It is yes. like a human voice put to music. And exactly. to be able to hear this opera um, with just, you know, the piano and the violin, because that's what came through, mm -hmm. was like, I'm not distracted by audience around me and people, you know, getting up or coughing or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I was like, and the loneliness of yes. the people that had to be who left their whole family in China and then they died. Like, you know, they didn't have the internet or iPhones or Skype or TV. And it was just goodbye. I may never see you again. And they were willing to go through all that pain. And we had a taste of it in COVID the, mm -hmm. in the early part when we were all, you know, you got to stay home. You can't, go anywhere when the whole world shut down and it was so quiet you could just hear birds and that mm -hmm. and like I I so much enjoyed the music and the singing because I've I've had voice training and I couldn't be able to sing that but the the freedom of of giving those emotions to us. And I I had the same feeling the other night when PBS had Les Mis on. Mm, like yeah. just being part of a, well, I've never been to France, but the part um, of, you know, it, these stories took place in a historical place and they're based on things that happened, both Les Mis and this one. And the singing was so beautiful. I picked, I could get all the words that were English. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like, I didn't need the, like the fact that I couldn't understand the, the Chinese dialects. It almost didn't make any difference because mm -hmm. the feelings in there were so beautiful. I think and, that's what makes opera uh, alive for people. Like, I mean, like, like I said, some people love it, some people hate it. But for oh, those I love of us that love it, <laughs> yeah, it's it's that kind of. It doesn't matter, right? It's like seeing into inside somebody's soul. You know, like I heard this expression: "It's an audible soul," right? You can you can hear inside somebody, and that's I think what what you were hearing tonight. But when you hear operas about somewhere in Europe you think I don't really relate to it like you know they they talk about my family as being white settlers it's like hold it my family's been here for about four or five generations and so when people refer to me as a settler I thought gosh We've never been to the old country, but but I'm learning to to live with with that terminology. But when I think of settling, it's like you you set your tent here, and you know when you figure that 
some of us have been here since the early 1800s um, that immigrated and anyway it, it, it isn't a prejudice it's just a, a way of sort of thinking that oh well they settled in BC my, my big thing is Gosh, once they hit the mainland of of the Maritimes, what made them keep going and going and going until they they actually hit British Columbia? It's like, wow. Yeah. But anyway, but learning about the Chinese history, because, you know, I have friends that are Chinese and everything. And... To hear it expressed, I, I, it was so, it was so touching, and I, I feel so sad for the families. Here I'm going on and on, that, <laughs> like, they just come here and they don't know a thing about what to expect. I mean, wow, that, and even the families now that come from wherever, and all of a sudden, this is a new country. I mean, they really are brave people. Yeah, for sure. I agree. And I think, you know, um, we have, like I said, men, there are many, many stories around us, right? And many, many different peoples from different places that have landed here in this place. And um, we need to tell all those stories for sure. And the singing was so lovely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Love to hear that. <laughs> I loved it. That's Thanks, great. Susan. That's lovely. Um, That's okay. it. I guess I have to put my hand down on the thing, whatever. Oh, we can do that for you. It's all good. You can do it for you. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for giving me so much time. <laughs> Thanks. Susan. Thank you for sharing, Susan. Um, and we've got a hand from Lori. Audio now unmuted. Okay. First, I want to say... Those ladies have wonderful voices. I could never sing like that. Um, Me neither. Julia can, though. <laughs> uh, not anymore, unfortunately. And anyway. when I listen to operas, I think of my aunt, who's been deceased for 22 years now. Um, she loved her operas. Mr. Bieber has left um, me. She loved her operas, and she loved her classical. So it makes me think of her when I hear operas like this mm -hmm. uh, because she loved so much of it. And I didn't grasp it as much when I was a kid when she used to take me. I would take my afternoon naps um, <laughs> and everything. But um, we have, I'm, I'm, I'm here in, in the States. So we do have Chinatown in San Francisco and it is a big place and there you learn a lot from the culture that you see there from China. So listening to this opera tonight coming kind of made me think of that, you know, what goes on at our Chinatown that we have here in the States. Um, I don't know if it's the same there in Canada, but, you know, um, than what we have here. But, you know, um, I think it's an interesting culture. And I think a lot of people have been misunderstood about their culture also. So I think people, you know, would get a lot to seeing something like this and learning more about how to deal with their culture of being Chinese. Thanks. Yeah, and it's such a rich culture as well, right? Um, yeah. The Chinese culture. So there's like 5,000 years of history to kind of, to deal with, right? right. So uh, there's, there's, there's lots there and uh, we, we just get a little taste of it uh, over mm -hmm. here. But it was it was a beautiful opera. Normally, I would have gone to sleep on the couch, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's saying something because unfortunately, yeah, we are missing the full experience of it, right? Like we didn't get to hear the orchestra. So I'll be anxious to hear when they can, where we can hear the whole recording of this, you know, yeah. and really embrace yeah. more of it, you know. Well, I think in the notes, maybe we can send out the link to the. Uh, the city opera website and you can maybe uh, uh subscribe to their newsletter or something like that if you're interested mm -hmm. and then and you'll hear when that recording is available that would be great thank you very much mm -hmm. thanks laurie 
Um, that was a wild ride, Julia. <laughs> Always happy to learn some new stuff in the space. And, you know, we, we've heard it said many times in the space tonight about the fact that we uh, maybe don't have this kind of education in our Canadian educational uh, fabric landscape. Um, certainly when I was in school and I'm, you know, it's been a while. But I remember, I mean, you know, they, they touched upon like ancient civilizations, um, but never did we <laughs> talk about like the folks that, like you said, that landed in Canada. And, uh, and I think my, my guess to that is, is that Canada was very embarrassed by some of the, those things and rightly should be, mm -hmm. um, I kind of just sort of hid those, you know? And I think also, you know, the, um, our education system has always been sort of centric. <laughs> that is to say, was Eurocentric and that it was kind of Eastern Canada or Central Canada centric. You know, we were learning in Vancouver when I was a kid, we were learning about, you know, the beaver trade and <laughs> like all that stuff that was happening in Ontario. And it's like, well, I think it would have been a lot more interesting to learn about what was happening in Vancouver a little bit in, in, in you know, a bit more, right? Uh, even though, of course, the history in Canada and in on the West Coast isn't as long as it, it was back then. But, um, you know, it just, I think the people that write the curriculum oftentimes are the ones that live back East. <laughs> and so, you know. I mean, I will say that that on the, on the news just today, um, because it's International Women's Day, they were interviewing um, an Indigenous woman who is, I think they said was the first Indigenous woman to be in in the, in the cabinet in Ottawa, who has left her position there after seven years. Um, and she said that um, in her, you know, grew up in Canada, in her education through the Canadian school system, was not prepared for how nasty it was in the house. The, the name calling and the yelling at each other and the back and forth across the aisle and all that kind of stuff. And so even like how we educate our uh, our population about how our government works that still is a big question mark for many folks and sometimes I think to myself oh my gosh what's the difference between an MP and an MLA and the house and the senate and what's the function of what right because that stuff wasn't emphasized or spent enough time on um in our in our systems yeah there's lots to learn that, that's that's for sure learn. every every generation we we get more stuff we have to cram into our heads in a you know between, sure. <laughs> between kindergarten and grade 12 or beyond you but know but now we have the good old google machine so hey. some of those things become more foundational and uh and some of those things become uh like what can you research as a companion uh piece to that so we've got one more hand from louise and that'll be our last hand so go ahead louise Hi, and thank you for sharing tonight, Julie. Oh, my pleasure. Um, you know, I, I enjoyed the music. I will say that. That was beautiful. But I enjoy learning the history, the, the story, the understanding, and especially the, my favorite part was the interview oh. at the end. Mm. Because we learned and understood more of the history. And as others have said, we don't know enough about history. I've lived in the Lower Mainland all my life, and I didn't know much about Chinatown. Didn't yeah. know about the... No, I can honestly say because in school, because of surgeries and different things, and when I was in school, it was more English math and, you know, and that than taking socials and science and things like that. I didn't get this kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, but the cult, learning about different cultures is important. And I thank you for coming tonight and just sharing what you could share with us. Yeah, thanks, Louise. Yeah, well, you do the best with what you got. Um, uh, and and I, I want to just pass on one thing just for anybody who's interested for um, their kids or grandkids or whatever. There's a book out there called Vancouver Kids that I used, um, you know, as a parent to share Vancouver's history with my children. And what they did is they actually went to the archives, the Vancouver archives, and they took the actual like sort of documents, like letters, accounts, um, you know, uh, uh, building plans, things like that. And they dramatized the stories of individuals involved, speaking from the, the 
the point of view of the the characters that whose story was written in um, in these individual stories. So there's one by Gassy Jack, right? The, mm -hmm. Gastown uh, founder or whatever. And then there are other ones from uh, around historical events in Vancouver. And um, it's it's actually just a really interesting read to read about the history of Vancouver, again, uh, through the, the the words and the historical uh, evidence left over um, from that time uh, in, from the archives. And I think we actually have an archivist in our audience today. I'm not going to call her out, but, um, I, I, I wonder if she knows about this book, but anyway, and, um, I, I, uh, I highly recommend if, uh, I have no idea, somehow doubt that at this, this point, an audiobook? I, that I don't know about that, you see, and this is why I'm thinking it needs to be something that is available in an audio format for, for kids who maybe need it in an audio format, right? And, and for the rest of us that, that is in, are interested in it. So it might be something to approach the Museum of Vancouver about because I think they were involved in the production of this book. Very cool, love that. Um, well, I mean, again, uh, it's been a wild ride and um, I thank you so much. I think we learned a lot and um, are, are uh, some folks who are getting who are a little bit more new to opera are getting a growing a, a more of an appreciation for the format and I think that that's really lovely to experience with this group. Uh, but before we officially say good night to you, Julia, hmm. we have a prize draw that we'd like to hmm. ask you to participate in. So there's Donna in the wings and Donna, I'm going to put you and Julia together and go ahead, go do, do the business. All right, here's the business. Julia, I am shaking up names in a bag. And anytime you want to say whatever you'd like, I, I'm, I'm just going to shout. I'm just going to shout, shout it out. Okay. Mm -hmm. you, you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. Uh -huh. Hoi san va. Hoi san va. It is Sue McAndrew. It's a good thing you identified Ooh. yourself. Look at that. Since, uh, since it's, so if we didn't pull a name called iPhone, we pulled a name called Sue. So awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's always why we like Donna would have double checked anyways if Sue hadn't had a question. Donna's got her eyes on the on the list. So uh Sue will connect with you offline to uh to get you your raffle prize. Um again, Julia, it's such a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us in the space. Um what's next for you? Um, I'm thrilled to not be known as iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say an iPhone called Sue, isn't that a Johnny Cash song? Or that's right, anything? that's right. It should be. <laughs> Do you, you know what? <laughs> My husband plays that just to bug me. <laughs> it's a great song, though. It's it is. Song. It's terrific. Yeah. Um, I. What's next for me? Um, yeah. Just you know, rig their old life at the CNIB. So, doing. There's lots of um, lots of stuff going on. Travel. You know. I, my thing is assistive tech, so I'm I'm working in different arenas. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know in terms of vocal eye or or whatever. I've had to kind of shift off some of the things I was doing that was art that were arts related, just because I'm getting swallowed up by my my job with CNIB. But uh, yeah, be fun to to do something else uh, artsy too in the future. Well, we look forward to whatever is the next time you are back in the space sharing with us. So you're, you of course are welcome at any and every time you come. Audio now on Thanks, here. guys. Thank you so much. Th awesome. Thank you. Vocal Eye, vocaleye.ca. Special thanks to our funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the British Columbia Arts Council, the province of British Columbia, and the city of Vancouver.